In this video, we will take a look at some really handy tips, tricks, and workflows for notch cameras. Here's the full list of topics uh, with the timecode. It is available in the description area as well. If you are interested in one or the other specific point of this list, go ahead and skip to that point or topic. And with that said, let's roll. So let's start with our list. The first point in this list is post effects on cameras. Now, before we talk about these post effects that are applied on cameras and why is it done so, uh, let's just talk a little bit about this scene in general, because this scene we're using quite a few times in all the other examples. So just so you know, there's a couple of uh, lights here. So we have skylight for general lighting. We have some spots to highlight the 3D meshes. Then we have a variety of 3D meshes and they are all rigged and imported from a Mixamo. Of course, we have several extras like these stairs or columns. Uh, and then here on the left hand side, we have uh, this centerpiece. And this centerpiece is just some deformer supplied on 3D models and a small particle system spawning from the models. So, post effects and why are they applied on the camera? As you see, uh, the post effects that I'm using here. They are quite intrusive. Uh, there is this bump map warp, which is working together with the fractal noise. And if I had to edit the 3D elements of this scene, it would become quite hard and quite intrusive over time. Hence, I don't really see the 3D models well. I see all of this abstract thing in the front, which is great because that's what I'm going for. But if I need to edit the scene, this becomes really, really tiring. So instead of attaching everything to the root, just for the sake of sample, I'm going to attach it now to the root. So instead of attaching uh, these things to the root, I'm attaching everything to the camera. So that means that when I'm in the orb view, which I am now, I see none of the post effects applied, and I can freely work with my 3D scene, and uh, nothing is obscuring my view. However, whenever I want to bring back the post effect treatment, I just hit zero, and I see all of them being applied and available. So this is really a trick to save your sanity and uh, it's applicable even in more ways when you start to build more complex setups and you have several cameras and you want those cameras to have different looks this is literally the easiest way to achieve that we'll come back to that a little bit more when we're going to talk about camera switches so this technique does not apply just to post effects you can actually do it with pretty much anything in notch uh, for instance here i have an image plane and it's piped through render layer and this render layer is actually attached to camera now the reason why i have render layer and image plane is because i want to see this fractal noise that is being used with a bump map warp and i don't want any other effects to affect it basically so i want this to be clean image plane on top of everything else thus render layer and of course it's connected to the camera so it always would maintain the same position so if i and out now to the orb view, you will see that this image plane is literally moving together with the camera. So from camera's point of view, uh, this image plane is always constant, always static, as it is moving together with the camera. This is a great uh, way to create uh, something like hoods or GUIs. For instance, if we wanted a circle around everything and we want that circle to be um, static at all times. All we have to do is grab a shape 3D, push it a little bit back, set it to, let's say, ring. Let's just rotate it. This could be somewhat bigger, and the inner radius could be smaller. And there we have a small 3D element that looks like a beginning of the GUI or HUD element. Now, as mentioned, now all of the post effects are applying on it as well. If we don't want the post effects to apply on it and we want to have this as a clean element, all we have to do is just add a render layer and pipe it to a render layer. This would make do with a little bit more subdivisions. I'm gonna set it to 80. Right, do we have to have that circle there? Absolutely not. Will I disable it? Yes, yes I will. So I think you get the gist of it. Uh, the easiest way to maintain the good workflow when you're editing your 3D elements is to have your post effects connected to the camera. So this applies not only to post effects, you can connect 3D elements, image planes, so on so forward, anything you want, anything you need. With that said, let's move on to the point number two, camera tilt and shift. So there is a post effect called tilt shift 
You might have discovered it already. And it literally works out of the box. Now I can choose to connect it either to the camera or the root wall, depending on what you really want or what you really like. Uh, I'll just mention that it's rather costly on your GPU performance. As you see, I'm not real time anymore. I'm definitely dropping out frames. So I'm not going to play it back. But the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because tilt shift requires one extra little node to be more flexible. So obviously you have quite a few options in the very node uh, tilt shift. Let's say what mode do you want to use? If you go for blur, it's significantly cheaper. It's definitely real time, but of course it doesn't look as pretty as it would if you are using sprites. So you have blur size, then you have max sprite size and color difference threshold. All of these are great settings, but if you want to actually address the focus area, you need an extra node and that extra node is gradient 2D. So I'm going to bring a new one straight from the node list. And all you have to do to make use of this node is just apply it on the first input tilt shift gradient node. So with that done, now you can shape the width of the focus, the angle of the focus, so on and so forth. For instance, I'm going to expand the inner radius and I'm going to make it a little bit angled. There we go. So you can make any tweaks you like, and if you actually want to see that gradient on the screen while you're making these alterations in the very tilt shift node, you can choose to go for show gradient only. So now when I'm making my alterations to the gradient, I literally see how does that gradient look, and I can shape it to a perfection or to my desired look. So I'm going to come back now to the tilt shift, and I'm going to choose sprites. There we go. So that's tilt shift. Super handy, although expensive on GPU. Definitely worthwhile if you're using it for video renders or for stills. This is a perfect tool for real-time purposes. I probably either use this with a blur or I wouldn't use it at all because, well, again, it just costs quite a bit to calculate it. Third point, camera depth of field plus focus target. This is more or less following the subject that we had before. So if tilt shift focuses a specific strip or a specific gradient on the screen, depth of field does that in a specific plane. And you might be already familiar with depth of field. It's a post effect. You literally grab it from the node list, apply it on the camera or the root, and off it goes, off it works. In the camera itself, you have three properties, focal plane distance, range, and blurriness. And you can alter all these things directly in camera. However, if you choose to grab a node called camera focus target, you can actually make that focusing dynamic. So all of these settings that are available here in camera are actually available now in camera focus target. Why is this node handy? Well, because you can now have a dynamic focus area. So basically you can animate it with modifiers, for instance, attach extra things to it as I'm here attaching this image plane, which literally just showcases where the focus is at what times. Or you can use this node, camera focus target, as a trackable or movable focus point. So if you double click on a node, you will see that the first input is transform modifiers. You can easily attach uh, something like a null to that input. So I'm gonna do exactly that. And now this null influences where the focus should be. So if you're making a dynamic uh, scene and you want to focus always would be on a hero model or a hero setup, this is literally how you would uh, do it. And then you can freely reposition the camera or the focus target and the focus would always stay connected to that null or that 3D object of your choice. Right. Moving on we have camera on spline. So this is just a very nice, very easy way to animate camera path and have quite a bit of control over it. Let me move on to the setup and let me just talk you through the different nodes that we have here. So we made a spline. There we go. And we used a spline follower with a camera attached and that spline follower has continuous modifier that just literally drives this camera around and around this circle. Now this camera is focused on the centerpiece via null and a target node input. And as you see, we have this camera focus target, the very same thing we spoke about in the last example. And this camera focus target is actually targeting center of this 
middle piece or this middle 3D model. So we are constantly in focus on that uh, 3D model. Right, so how do we set up all this crazy? How do we set up the splines and how do we enable camera to actually work on the splines? I'm going to make a simple repro and I'm going to show you exactly that. So let's call this spline camera. First of all, we need some kind of a model that we can refer to, or I'm going to turn on the grid. That will help a lot. So let's add a shape 3D. I'll leave it in the center. And now let's build that spline system. Obviously, you can import splines from other packages, but I usually choose to build splines inside of Notch because it's just much more flexible. First of all, we need a a spline node and spline node works with the nulls as points or as a control points. So I'm going to grab a first null. I'll make sure to position it a little bit on the side. I'm going to make a copy of this null connected to the same input, the spline nodes. I'm going to offset it. As you already see, we're drawing a spline. And as I see, it's curving uh, this way and that way. So basically now it's curving to the uh, left-hand side, and I want the opposite, so I'm going to rotate it. And I will add a third null. There we go. And I will position it somewhere here. Again, it's rotating to the opposite side that I want, so I'm just going to rotate it. And since I have three points, I could easily just close off the spline. And there's a property in spline node that allows you to loop, so I'm going to set it to looping. There we go. We have three point spline already. So what can we do with this? Well, first of all, let's grab a spline follower. Let's connect it to the root. And now I can feed this spline to the spline followers, spline node input, and the setup is complete. So this spline follower now can output many things, anything from 3D object to a camera, and we can use this path to run it. So I'm going to grab a shape 3D for now, just for the sake of sample, and then we're going to attach the camera. So in a spline follower, I have spline time, and if I had something like continuous modifier or math modifier or keyframes, this just goes round and round or follows the animation that you set in. This is all great, but if you add camera, and start to move the spline time, you will see that the camera is always looking at the initial point of view. Now that's not necessarily desirable. Perhaps you want to build something like a tunnel system and you want camera always to look ahead in accordance to the spline. Well, for that, on the spline follower node, we have a property called rotation follows direction. And now with that selected, camera is always, always looking at the direction of the spline. There is one more property that is worthy to mention. And that's rotation look ahead time. So basically, as you increase this, the camera starts to uh, shift a little bit earlier than the actual angle comes. So it just becomes gradually smoother. Well, let's look through this camera. In fact, if we want to look through this camera, we might as well have some animations. So I'm going to add a continuous modifier to drive the spline followers time. There we go. Let's give it a bit of speed. Okay, that's excessive. Maybe one is just enough. And there we are. We are following the spline. I see the little bit of this 3D model in the center. You don't have to keep your camera directly on the spline. You can always offset it. That's literally what I did. This, is, this spline is literally just a reference. But as you see, it works and it fulfills the task and it always looks ahead. So that's one way of using it. But you can always choose to target a 3D model to a camera. I'm going to do that. So now not only we're spinning around this uh, 3D shape or sphere, we're actually always looking at it as well. Just for the sake of sanity, I'm going to put it back directly on the spline so you see it better. There is a little bit of this swish going on when the camera is moving, and that can be addressed in the spline node. As you see, there's different properties. We can use spline time mode as knots or length. So if we choose length, it becomes much, much smoother. And if you want to smooth it out further still, choose normalize spline time. Now, it might influence the speed, but all of a sudden it's more evenly spread out as it moves around. There we go. So yet one more handy thing to mention here when it comes to splines and cameras. The spline points or the, the pivot points, they are not locked. 
You can use math modifiers or animations to drive their position, rotation, you name it. And that is exactly what makes it really powerful in Notch. All of a sudden your spline is dynamic, so you can drive it with sound, you can drive it with, well, anything you want. With that said, before we move on, I'll just quickly mention that if you're not happy with the angles that are produced by default, you can always go for the scale property and extend it or decrease it using the blue handle. There we go. So this is really handy if the angle is a little bit too sharp. So basically you have full control over your splines, rotations, pivots, even the smoothness of it. If we're back now to the sample, that's number four, camera on spline. You see all of these things literally applied in this scene. So we have a spline, it has four control points. It's connected to the spline follower. Spline follower is with a continuous modifier and it's outputting the camera and the camera is always looking at the center and there's a little focus target, making sure that our depth of field is always, always locked in to the centerpiece. Now we can see the spline, but perhaps we just don't want to. So in the spline, there is a property called show spline. So we can just hide it and the scene is more or less complete. This video is sponsored by Silent Hill Hotels and Spa. In these trying times, if you want to escape your routine and enjoy an exciting weekend getaway with lots of surprises, fun physical activities and friendly locals, look no further. Head straight to Silent Hill Hotel and Spa. As hotel's general manager Dalia Gillespie states, no one has yet to come back and complain. Big thank you to our sponsor and now back to cameras. Okay, next point, number five, camera switch with tweening nulls. This is quite a handy setup as well because you can define specific locations via nulls and switch through them uh, dynamically. So basically it's just very smooth, gradual transition from one position to the second one, to the third one, so on and so forward. And to control this, you can use modifiers. In this case, I'm using math modifier or you can use something like MIDI controller or C controller or web GUI, you name it, whatever actually you need. This is probably one of the nicer ways to switch through cameras smoothly. Now, if you want to delve deeper into how to use this kind of a setup with a MIDI controller, I have a link for you in a description area. I literally show you how to connect a MIDI controller, how to take advantage of this setup with the MIDI buttons as a dynamic setup. But for now, let's just focus on how to set up the actual tweening null and how to use it with the camera. So again, I'm gonna make a new layer and I will call this tweening null. So this is my approach. Uh, obviously you don't have to do it exactly as I do, but I find it as an easiest approach. Um, I'm gonna grab a 3D object, for instance, this looking around 3D mesh. There we go. I'm going to make sure that it has a bit of animation. So I'm going to change the animation set. It's completely flat lit because, well, we don't have any lighting nodes in the scene. So I'm going to add a skylight. I will turn on deferred rendering, anti-aliasing and high dynamic range. And I'm going to make this skylight cheaper, something like 50 iterations in the sample directions. This is good enough for us to start. So the easiest way to set up the tweening null for the camera use is to literally add several cameras with specific positions. So I'm typing in camera and I'm going to connect it to the root and I'm going to find a position that I like, for instance, something like this. Now I can right click on the camera, go for camera options and use the property called set to current view. And the camera that I just brought in jumped exactly to the spot where I had my uh, orbit view. And if I pan out a little bit, you will see that the camera is literally there. So let's do this again. I'm going to Move it a little bit to the side, right click, camera options, set to current view, camera is there. And if I hit zero, I'm literally looking through this camera. So this will be my position one. I will disable this camera and I'll grab another one. Uh, well, actually I can be in this camera's view and I can just find another position that I like. For instance, something from above, something like this. So this is my position two or the second camera. And let's add the third one, connect it to the root. And that's going to be my third position. There we go. So now we have three cameras in the scene. So what do we do now with these three cameras? Well, we want to grab their positional values and feed it to tweening null. So I'm going to grab a tweening null. 
connected to the root and you will see that there is a input for the nulls. So this input defines the coordinates of where should the tweening null move its uh, operator, whatever that might be. Is it a 3D object, a camera, you name it. So instead of connecting cameras to this input, well, let's just convert all of these cameras literally to nulls. So I'm going to go for replace node with geometry. There is a null node. Let's do that same operation here. Geometry, null, geometry. Null. So now we have uh, three nulls and they're all with the specific coordinates that we set into those cameras. So now we can grab all three of them connected to the tweening null, add a camera as an output for tweening null. If we hit zero and we offset the null index, you will see that we're scrolling through all three positions that we set up with the initial three cameras. Now, the reason why I've used cameras to start this with, because I, I was really keen to know exactly where the camera will be or how will it look, how the shot will look. So the easiest thing to do is just to literally grab a camera, position it the way you like, uh, add the second one and the third one, or how many cameras you want, and then replace them with nulls and feed it to tweeting null. And then from there, you can literally switch through one and the other and the third, so on and so forward. And you have adaption rate. So basically how fast or how smooth is the swap between one camera and the other. This is very, very handy if you're building a dynamic 3D scene for DJing or for live performance. I use it quite a lot. And swapping through cameras to nulls is probably the easiest way to know exactly what you're going to get in that specific position where the null is. So if we come back to the sample, you will see that this is literally it. This is the very setup we've just discussed. There's just a very slow math modifier set to a saw operation and it's switching through three null positions. Okay, so then moving on to the sixth point in the list, camera switch with select a child node. This is probably my favorite way of making very fast and very dynamic scenes. I mean, all you need is uh, somewhat of a soundtrack, uh, select child node, couple of cameras that you can switch through and you're pretty much good to go if you add some post effects on them. Let's check it out. Let's go full screen. Right, enough of fooling around, let's talk about this setup. So select child node allows you to choose which operator that is connected to it is being rendered on screen at what time. So let me just make a little simple setup so I can actually showcase this uh, a bit more clearly. And we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about every single operator that we have in this specific scene. So there we go. There's our select child, new layer. I'm going to grab a shape 3D. I'm going to connect it to the root. And I will make several copies of this shape 3D. So there's second copy. Let's just offset it in 3D space. Let's make a third one. So now we have three operators. So imagine that these three are our cameras and we don't want to render them all at once. We literally want to cut in between them. We can do that with the select child node. So once we connect it to the root, and if we choose all of these operators and connect it directly to the select child node output, now we have an index and we can choose which one is actually being rendered on screen at what time. So to drive this, we can use anything from matte modifier to MIDI controller to OAC controller, you name it. So this is just a perfect way of making a dynamic cut, which is very easy to set up and very fun to use. So with the basic out of the way, well, let's come back to the scene and let's talk about every single operator available here. So for now, I'm going to disable this math modifier, which is driving the switching. This math modifier is literally set to random noise in a scale of three because we have operator zero, one, two, three, 
and that makes four four operators in general. So zero, zero, <laughs> one, two, three. And uh, these are literally switching through all those values. Uh, and I'm using quantize modifier in between because I don't want any incremental information in between, let's say 1.2 or 2.5. I literally want zero, one, two, or three as a value. So I'm using quantize and that quantize node makes, makes it so that we have literally no increments in between, only those values. So enough about that. I'm going to disable it for now. And let's talk about the zero setup. So camera zero. And what's going on there? So this setup right here is all based on a camera. But I'm not connecting camera directly to the select child node because I anticipate that I might want to add a couple of 3D elements or some image planes or some other crazy and weird stuff. So I usually use select child node with a null. And that null is the operator output and from that null I can connect anything I exactly want to use. So in this case I have a camera, a render layer with an image plane. Well basically exactly what we had in our first example is just it's all in black and white except for this image plane except for this um, fractal noise that you see here. And that's pretty much it. That's my first setup. So then if we switch to the second operator, which is number one here, there's a little bit more crazy going on. So here I'm using a spline. So I'm going to disable the math modifier that is driving splines animation. And you will see that this spline goes back and forward through the center of the scene. If I disable now the rendering camera, you will see the spline on the screen. So let's just show it. So it's just moving from the bottom or from the end of the scene to the front of the scene. And it's moving with the math modifier set to a random noise operation. So basically it's just jumping around back and forward, back and forward. Plus this camera is continuously spinning around its axis just to make it a little bit more dynamic. And then we have a bit of depth of field and a couple of post effects like pixelate. And I figured it would be interesting to add a text element to this whole thing. So there is a circle, a ring and a little text connected to the camera too. So since it's connected to the camera, it always looks like it's literally there, static, it doesn't turn. So let's just uh, switch through to the camera and see what it shows. Let's see the output. Yeah, there we go. So there's a bit of crazy going on. There's the same bump map warp being used from the previous setting as a post effect. And that's our setup number two. By now you probably already see how much potential does the connecting of post effects and various other objects to camera directly has. It literally opens a whole lot of new possibilities and it makes it so easy to make dynamic and insane settings. So this is our camera one, so operator two. Let's switch through again. So now we're in this setup. So here we have a couple of mirrors, uh, a little feedback blur, and we have an image plane with a GUI. So basically it's just a video file with some text and some panels flying around. And yeah, that's our setup number three or camera two. Moving on, we have a fourth operator, so camera three. And here's a bit more interesting or complex things happening. So here I'm actually using um, a fisheye camera. Uh, obviously Nosh has an abundance of choices when it comes to cameras and we are going to look at a couple of more of them. But here is a fisheye camera. It does exactly what the name states. It's just really wide fisheye camera and it works kind of the same as any other camera out there. You can still connect things to it. You can still connect post effects and you have all the controls in this camera as you would have in a regular camera. So here I'm using a couple of shape 3Ds set to a ring. So they are going back and forward. And here I have a render layer with a text node. And uh, that text node is uh, driven uh, by a node called scramble text string. I really love this because just a couple of alterations, you can actually make some really random, really fun things with it. So you get the text string that you want to use. In my case, I'm using more is more. And then you have an option on how should it should this text be scrambled? So do you want all of the characters to be scrambled? Do you want only specifics? You have the amount, you have the rate and the seed. So it's just a fun note to make abstract and weird animations. Love it. Right, a little bit further down, we have another select child node. So there is no limit on how many 
select childs, we can put one after the other. This little setup right here is driving uh, these lighting rods. In fact, I'm going to disable some of the post effects I'm using here for you good people to see it better. So I have three 3D objects. Maybe let's just pan out from the active rendering camera. And these 3D objects are somewhat of a lightning effect models. And they are all working with a bit of distortion. And this select child node literally switches through one, the one, the two, and the three. And they're same model is just positioned in three different spots and there's a couple of post effects one of them is glow making it so that it looks like these lightnings is glowy or so it becomes a bit more splashy and that's that that's our last setup all of these four things are switching back and forward dynamically with this matte modifier that i mentioned before so if you're in a business of making energetic visuals and you don't want to spend time rigging thousands and thousands of nodes. This is probably your best bet. You set select child node, you output several cameras, apply different post effects, add a couple of 3D models in between, and there you are. You have a dynamic scene. Right, let's move on to the point seven, UV cameras and projection remapping. So this uh, setup right here has two layers, one for the actual technical setup and the designs and the other one for the previous so we actually see what we created and how does it apply and how does it output let's talk about this setup so notch has a tool called uv camera so if you have a, a 3d object of your choice not only you can do all the crazy designs with it that you want but you can actually output animations on the layout of its uv map so let Let's just simplify this a little bit and let's go through it point by point. First of all, I'm looking now through the active rendering camera, which is my UV camera. If I hit five, I'm back in a orb view. So here we have a 3D object and it's fed with a material. And this material is set up with this crazy chain of things, which allows you to set up a specific perspective and a specific mapping. I'm going to disable that for now. I will add a skylight so we see things a little bit better. I will disable this render to texture and I'm gonna hit zero for us to see exactly what the UV camera is outputting. So UV camera is outputting all of the coordinates of all of these facets of this 3D model. So if we hit zero, I see this is the arc. These are the bigger elements. These are the smaller elements. So why is this setup exciting? Well, majority of modern building mappings or uh, product mappings are happening via media server. A media server takes a 3D object that is one-to-one -one replica of that building that you are to map on. So there are people who spend days on end making a perfect 3D model that befits that specific building. So that 3D model has a UV layout for textures. And in media server, all your crazy designs are applied directly to those panels or those UV slots, and then it's projected on the building. So by using UV camera as output, we can cater specifically to that setup, to that UV. In this case, I'm just using a skylight, but I can add a spotlight connected to the root. I'm going to press five. So we pan out and we can set, let's say, some kind of a bit more dynamic angle for it. Something like that. Let's set shadows too. Once you hit zero, that light right there is directly reflected. It's literally being shown. And you can live animate all of the changes in the light pans, so on and so forward. So this is already impressive. This is pretty cool. You literally grab the 3D model that the media server operator provided you with, set up lighting, grab the UV camera, hit zero, and you send him back this as a block or a rendered content, and it fits his model and his mapping perfectly. That's all cool. But this can go a little bit further and this can be a little bit more advanced. Sometimes placement of the projector for your mapping job doesn't align with the crowd placement. For instance, your crowd might be somewhere here looking at the building from the bottom upwards with a bit of an angle and your projectors are set up just dead in front of the building. Usually you would like to have them dead straight or as straight as you can because, well, the less of the slanter, the better quality of the projections you have but i'm not going to talk about that as i'm not av tech so if you need to cater for a specific perspective 
and you still want to use UV camera workflow and you want to make some crazy designs, that's exactly where render to texture comes very handy. So I'm going to delete these two lights and I'm going to enable the render to texture. So render to texture allows us to render notch content off screen or basically render and consolidate that without showing it in the viewport. However, if I press on the show render to texture, you will see exactly what's going on in that setup. So here off screen, we're rendering this same 3D object with a specific camera angle and we're using a couple of deformers to sort of displace or manipulate this 3D object. So here's a displacement, so it sort of gives this jiggly look you will see in a second, there we go. And then there's chunk effector deformer that just takes all the bits of this building out and then brings it back again. If you are completely new to deformers, I left some links in the description area, do check them out. Hopefully it will be enough for you to get excited and to start using them. So we have a 3D model, we're altering it with a displacement deformer and with the chunk effector deformer. And we have a couple of lighting nodes here. So we're using skylight, a couple of spotlights, and we have an environment map attached. As I mentioned, we're looking at this from a specific perspective and we are rendering this to the texture. So this texture is not visible on screen. However, we are piping this texture to the material node. So all of this crazy that we have here is now being piped as a color texture to this material node. And we can apply it on the 3D object that we're using in the main scene. So the important bit of translating the correct angle or correct perspective from the render to texture to material is happening via the camera node that is attached to the render to texture and a mapping node that we're using with this material. And there are a couple of things that you need to set up there to make it work correctly. First of all, you need to reference the camera that you want to use for the perspective. You have to pipe it in the first input transform modifiers. So this camera now is referred to by mapping node. And in the mapping node, you have to choose mapping type. There's quite a few available. The one that you need for this to work is perspective. So now mapping node knows that it has to look at this camera's perspective and send the data to the material node to output the textures correctly for this 3D object. Right, one extra thing you should be aware of is the UV scale setup. Now in my case, for things to align correctly, I had to set UV scale Y to minus one. I marked it up here as a comment as well. And if we roll back to the material that we are piping this mapping node to, I literally don't want this to be affected by any lighting setup at all in the scene. I want this to be unlit and only refer to this color texture that we're sending from render to texture. So I'm unticking the lit. Now let's talk about UV camera. By default, when you add UV camera to node graph, it will be set to a UV channel color. And in our case, it doesn't really work out, does it? So all you have to do is change the UV channel to color original UVs. And depending on how media server sees this UV, you might want to flip the X or Y values. In my case, I wanted to flip Y and I'm sending all of the setup to this previous layer right here. So in this previous layer, I'm calling out the setup layer via layer precomp. I have the whole list of available layers and the one that I want is UV camera projection mapping. And then I'm applying it as a texture to this 3D object in this scene. So this is more or less how media server would receive it. And then it's up to a media server operator to just output it correctly. And as you see, it works out for the projector's view and it's working out for a public's view. And our public is somewhere here in the bottom below the building. There we go. That's more or less, well, <laughs> this is the correct angle. Right, this is a rather complex setup. I hope I made sense when I was explaining this and I'm sure you're gonna let me know in the comments if I didn't. It's not a everyday use case. However, if you, face these challenges or if you work with projection mapping, being able to do all of these things rendering live is pretty darn nice. So if I haven't mentioned something or if you have any questions about this, do check out the work file because it's available for download and just replace the model that I used with the model that you need to use. However, be very much aware that having a non-overlapping 
clean, nice UVs is essential here. If your UVs is all over the place, or if they're overlapping, then none of this, none of this will work the way it's intended. So to finish up, I'm just going to mention what we have here in this layer. So basically we're using multicam to output two cameras, one looking straight at the building, one looking from the perspective that we set in. We have a little crowd here made with a random cloner and we have a couple of lighting nodes. All right, and that's that. So now we can move on to the point eight of this list and that's 360 camera. I find it extremely handy when it comes to pre this. Let's say I have a customer whom I'm delivering stage design and that customer has no understanding of how will this look when let's say he or she will stand on a stage or how will it look when someone is standing in a crowd and looking at the stage. Well, there's no easier way to showcase these things for people than uh, setting up a 360 camera and rendering out a 360 view of your scene. And that's as easy as just uh, adding it into the notch node graph. So we have a node called VR360 camera just pipe it in, connect it to the root, and send your setup to render. So I'm going to place this on a desktop. A few minutes later. All right, our render is done. Let's preview it. Desktop, there's our video. I'm using Windows default movies and TV uh, app, and it actually allows you to preview things as 360. So there we go. We're actually previewing this render that we just made in 360. This is applicable for any VR set that is out there, and this is applicable for uh, rendering to 360 YouTube setup. However, you might want to run your render through a spatial or sp spatial media injector for uh, YouTube to understand that it's a 360 video. So I'm going to leave a link in the description of where to download it. It's literally available in GitHub. And all you do is just uh, open it up, Make sure to navigate to your 360 video, mark up that is, well, 360. And then all you have to do is choose inject metadata. Once you do that, hit save and uh, there we go. There's an injected video. And as you see now, even in this app, it already opens in the 360 view because it actually knows that it has to be treated as 360. So this is super neat to send to your customer as a previs for him to check out in a YouTube link or to check out in a VR set if he or she has one. And there you are, you're done. So I think this is where we're gonna stop today. There's obviously much more that can be shown or said about notch cameras. There's abundance of ways to apply it. And if you check the list of cameras, you will see that there's quite a few of them to choose. Obviously you can even do full VR uh, setups if you choose so, but that's a discussion for another day. I hope you found something interesting here. I left some referral links to different pork flows and different things I've mentioned in the description area. Thank you for watching this video and uh, see you in the next one.